This is the Awful Announcing Podcast. Here's your host, Brandon Contes. All righty. Welcome to the reboot episode of the Awful Announcing Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Contes. And for episode one of the latest iteration of the Awful Announcing Podcast, we have Bomani Jones on the show, who... I think is one of the most versatile entertainers in sports media. You got Game Theory on HBO, The Right Time on ESPN, and Bomani, who was a guest on the Awful Announcing podcast back in 2014, which I think officially allows me to call him a friend of the program. <laughs> Bomani, thanks for joining us again today. A lot has changed since 2014. Are you even aware that you are a repeat guest on, on the podcast? Now, I do remember doing it. I just didn't remember that it was 2014. <laughs> yeah, a long time ago. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about your path to ESPN, but also your path into sports media. Because when you got started, you have a master's in economics, a master's in politics, you're working on your doctorate, and you start writing about sports. So at that time, was it a hobby? Or is it something that you were interested in making a career out of? Well, I think at that time, I was doing more music stuff than I was doing sports. And then, uh, coincidentally, me and grad school decided that we were not the greatest mix. Let's just call that a mutual decision, shall we say. And then after that, like, in a lot of ways, the ESPN thing kind of fell into my lap. Like, after I found out I wasn't going to, uh, I had not passed the micro qual, which was basically go find something else to do with your life, I got a call from ESPN about, hey, we'd like you to do more stuff. And then that kind of built into that but my plan was always to write in some form of fashion the surprising part was when the sports stuff came around because i don't i mean i'm not exactly sure how it goes now at this point in time but then this was before the internet had kind of opened the door as to who could get the jobs and so at that point i'm 24 25 years old i haven't done the thing where you cover the high schools and i really don't want to do the thing where you cover the high schools like i didn't want to do all those introductory steps i readily admit and I just got lucky that in the expansion of the net and people kind of looking for different approaches and different ways to go about sports that didn't require you to have that nuts and bolts journalism training, I was able to get in at that point. Yeah, so you were you were building a, a digital following. And even when you when you started radio, you were kind of prioritizing a streaming audience before radio prioritized that that streaming audience. It, it was that and then also you start you host you're hosting a podcast before everybody has a podcast. So like were you just taking advantage of where you could build an audience or was that having some foresight into a shift of, of where the industry was headed eventually? Well, when I was working in Raleigh and I was trying to do the podcast stuff, it was interesting because I couldn't get them to understand what was going on. But the rationale on their end made sense. They weren't making any money off of this digital stuff. They made money off of that ratings book. They made money off of people saying, we listen to this on the radio. And so they wanted to induce as many people as possible to listen on the radio. But for my own personal goals, my own personal aims, why would I not want to send this stuff out if I can't? Right. Why would I not want to provide access to it to people who aren't necessarily in the market? Now, my bosses are saying we sell ads to the market, so we don't care about this, all of which um, makes perfect sense. But for me, if I was going to go somewhere, I need to give people access to what it was that I was doing and give them a chance um, to go ahead and hear it. So in a lot of ways, it was personal. But then when I started working for the uh, station in Canada, uh, the Sirius station, the whole reason I went there was because they had a massive podcasting operation and I knew that I would be able to distribute my work um, to a bunch of people. And I think where, particularly in that time, I think I was correct about it. It may be a little bit different then. I mean, different now, but I did not look at the digital product and the analog product as being substitutes for one another. If you could listen to the show on the radio, you would listen to the show on the radio. If you cannot listen to the show on the radio, well, okay, cool. I got this thing for you. That was the way that I was looking at it at that time. And I think that for where we were in the industry at that time, it probably made sense. How long were you doing the, the Canada show? That was the score? Yeah, I did that for a year, coming up on two years, but it was about a year and a half. And how much of it was a local audience? In the very beginning, the audience was very much so local. But through my own little independent podcast and operation that I was running, I had built an audience that was all over the place. Right. Um, and that was in part because I had figured out the Twitter game pretty quickly and then was using this to put it stuff out on Twitter, put the stuff out on Facebook. 
But I do remember very clearly when I did the first day on the score, they were able to put together a promo for the next day. That was all the people calling. Glad you're back. Glad you're back. Glad you're back. And so a lot of it was local, certainly. Like when we would look up, even to this day, when we look up the stats for the Right Time podcast, it's still a heavy North Carolina lean. Um, yeah. Do you miss doing local radio? Um, there's a component to local radio that I miss. Like there's an intimacy to it that I absolutely did miss having. Like I missed the phone calls. I missed talking yeah. to people who would call up regularly three, four, five times a week. Um, I missed having that. There's something to be said for having an audience where you know exactly what it is that they want to talk about. You know how to get there and you're part of the culture that they want to hear about. So like if Carolina Duke was last night, not only do you know everybody wants to talk about Carolina Duke, hell, you want to talk about Carolina Duke. That's what you were doing all day long yesterday. And I think that when you're doing local, you are a member of the tribe in a way that you not even with a podcast do I think that you can really replicate what it is to be part of a, doing it local because with the podcast yeah it's community but by and large it's built around you right it's not built about something bigger than you and so when you're doing local what you're doing typically is about something that is bigger than you I think the uh the caller thing with with radio is such a it's almost like a controversial topic inside sports radio in, in terms of whether hosts like taking calls or, or dislike it. Like so, some hosts just absolutely hate it. I'm in the Northeast where New York is, is built on callers. Um, I'm actually surprised that it, in North Carolina, was that something that the station, uh, did they have a policy of taking calls or is that something that you just preferred? No, at the time, uh, the station, I think opinions and callers was one of the taglines of the station at the time. They don't really do it like that so much no more. Yeah. But at the time, the caller part was big. But for me, I recognized that part of why you wanted callers was you wanted the listener to feel themselves in the show. Like you wanted to reflect the audience, give them a bit of a voice. There was that part. The other part for me is any place that I did a show that had callers or anything like that, I attract really interesting people who call. Yeah. And so the callers themselves wound up becoming characters in a different way yeah. and not in the format where a lot of shows where you got your call screener who really is going through and, you know, meticulously figuring out who's worth getting on the air or not. I'd be like, throw anybody on. If they bad, throw them off. If they're good, it's about to be magic. Did you take calls on the ESPN radio show, the national show? Yes, we did. Um, that they're not nearly as much fun. <laughs> like that that i would say like the ones that less came consistent with me, i'm sure also correct like those who came with me okay cool then we could have something but like a national syndicated audience unless you really had years to cultivate your your crew of people the call of game was not nearly as much fun there um you've been with espn for about 20 years in in various capacities obviously a, a lot of changes have occurred within the company in that time the company just had another round of layoffs as a long-time employee what's your level of concern every time espn has one of those waves um personal concern none and it's not because i think i'm untouchable um for me it's just kind of if you're gonna do it you're gonna do it like i'm not especially at this point you know after all this time i'm not that's not something that typically or generally uh causes me a great level of concern it's always worrisome just because of how it affects the people that you wind up meeting sure. and knowing over time like that that's the one for me it's just it's it's disappointing in that way because this is real life for a lot of people and a lot of people who haven't made as much money as i have so like you lay me off tomorrow all right cool i'll figure it out right. um not everybody really has that same luxury um in that way but now this happens every few years where they kind of look around and then you personally look at what it is with your contract or how long it's going to be or how much money you make it for this person or that person um or everything else but i find myself more concerned with some of the people i know and the people around me because like if you know you can generally do the math on these things and figure out who it is that they are probably going to come for i guess i probably fit closer to the who you're going to come for demographic than i ever had previously but you know you worry for those people especially you know the ones you know think it can't happen to them and yeah. you know it just might buddy it just might uh, ESPN radio was, was hit pretty hard, especially behind the scenes. So as somebody that hosted nationally drive time on ESPN radio for a bit, what, what do you think the, the future holds for that platform? So that's a tricky one for me to answer because I haven't had a car in six years. Okay. Right. Like I live in New York. Um, I, to me, 
radio overall, not specific to ESPN. Yeah. For me personally, radio has become less relevant um, than it has ever been. But I also live in a city that I'm not from and I don't have a car. Like I, I'm not in a position to be the person who actually listens to radio. I do think that the podcast, the availability and accessibility of podcasts has made things trickier for that radio audience, if only because they're like, that's not the only game in town to get local sports, not just sports generally, but local sports. Now there are more ways for people to consume local and the audience will always prefer local over national. And so I know for myself personally, when I was doing ESPN radio, the dilemma for me is how exactly am I supposed to do a show in this time slot that is attractive to the entire country full of people, right? Like what is it that we could talk about that everybody in America wants to talk about, but they can't get locally. That's a really, really, really hard thing to do. And I think that that's a dilemma that just about everybody faces um, in this industry. Like if you're going to make a national sports show work, it really comes down to the dedication of the people behind it saying, we're going to make this work. Like you take Mike and Mike, for example, the decision was made, they were going to make that work and they made it work. Colin is a little bit different to me. um, And I guess Jim Rome also fits this in a way where they want to try to reinvent the wheel on this one. They're like the thing that we could talk about all the time that all of America cares about football. So we're going to give you all the football you want. I'm a person that probably gets bored talking about football all the time. It's not how they get down. They can get it. They can go, but there's just not a lot of ways for you to appeal to that type of audience. Um, like across the board, it's really, really, really hard to pull off a national radio show in this day and age. So did you find that when you were hosting that you had that support? Like, did, did you not think that ESPN was all in on, on your show? No, no, no. All in. No. Um, I wouldn't say they were out necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. Like for me, at least kind of fluctuated depending upon who was in charge. Some people were more enthusiastic than others. Like I can point to one superior who definitely, I think felt invested to making this work. And then that person was replaced by somebody else who at times it felt like was dedicated to getting me up out the paint and I could look around and see things and be like, Oh yeah, no, no, no. There's, there's (laughs) this, this is not getting the, the support from upstairs that I would like, like, I don't even tell the story very often, but I went up there to Bristol one time. Um, Now, you know what? I'll save that for the memoir. Well, come on. Give me give me something. Oh, no, I tell you. I mean, it happened. Yeah, go ahead. Like, it's what just, I mean, it, I don't know how they do things now with the studio, but I walked in and they always had these big movie posters for all the shows and for a lot of shows um, that weren't even on anymore. Right. So you could go up there like I'm trying to think like Eric Casillas, for example. Like, I don't know if there was a poster for him, but they'd be there. And I remember when I had gone up there and I'd seen the poster for my show and I was like, oh, that's really cool. And I came back at some point, I think this is maybe like 2017 and I'm looking on the walls and, uh, I don't see mine and I'm like, oh, okay. I don't really think much of it, but I'm like, oh, I wonder what that's about. And then somebody looked over at this one poster and they saw something and they peeled down the corner of it and eventually peeled it back. And somebody had taped over the poster for my show with one for something else. They just, just put another one on top of it. That doesn't make you feel like, uh, whoever's in charge there is invested in your all success. In, yeah. Did you, did you ever, did you comment on it or question it or? Like- um, not really. Like, I think I, I think whoever was the person on like physically there at the time came and gave me some, ah, you know, under like, what do you say? If you're the other, if you if you're the boss on the other side, what do you say? There's nothing for you to say. And on my end, what am I gonna do? Whine about a poster, right? You know, like all the only thing there is for me to say in that situation is I take this as a reflection of something greater and problematic. But that ain't going nowhere, right? Yeah. yeah. What I'm gonna do? Sit in there and cry about it? Like, look, if somebody couldn't stand to see my face for whatever reason, like I wasn't even in there. If somebody couldn't stand to see my face, then fine. They couldn't stand to see my face. But you know, you look at it and you know. There is somebody here, whoever it is. By the way, the thing that they pasted over me with was something that wasn't even on the air no more. So, like, I think it was a podcast. Like, it wasn't even a radio show. But it was somebody just walked up there and just decided, we don't want to look at you no more. How much longer were you on the air after that? Not long. um, Probably about five, six months. But 
like I think something that has been misreported by dishonest people over the last uh, six years about this is when High Noon was coming around, I was like, look, I want to put my energy toward this television show and I would like to transition from doing this radio show to doing a podcast. And they agree. Like, I don't think anybody put up that much of a fight over me doing it. You know, like, I don't want to pretend as though people were throwing themselves in front of the train to stop it. Yeah. But I decided I mean, my agent and I looked around and were just like, look, it's a better use of time and it's probably better for me to take this to a podcast rather than doing radio. Like this wasn't a situation where they canceled it in spite of the fact that some people may not have wanted to see my face. We made that call on our end and it was one of the best decisions I think we've ever made. Did you, do you think that it, it was headed down the road of being canceled though? No, no, no. Like, I mean, maybe like this is one thing I find when people talk about what was going on with my radio show is ain't nobody ever gave a damn this much about an ESPN radio show that came on after one o'clock. Yeah. as people like seem to care about a claim was it headed toward cancellation i don't have any reason to believe why nobody ever had any conversation with me that was like oh buddy you're in trouble um when i was doing that and the times where i would get the ratings everybody was falling like it was just a time where the network itself was trying to figure out hold how to hold on to the people they had and every slot seemed to be falling like the ones i remember is where everybody was falling and we were holding flat my disagreement that I had while working in radio there was, and I get where they were coming from, was that they make money off of these ads on terrestrial. And so they're trying to figure out how you can come up with this show again that's going to serve the entirety of your terrestrial audience, which is incredibly difficult, especially in the PPM era. Like this is, this is just really, really hard for you to pull off. But I'm looking at our numbers. I'm like, yo, we're doing really well on digital and we're doing really well on series. My outlook is it is your best bet to serve the audience you have rather than to chase the audience that you don't. But that's not how those people make money and how everybody gets promoted. So they weren't going about it in that way. And so, I mean, I look at my pro look at what I'm doing and I'm like, if this is attractive on digital, and attractive on series, then we need to go to a place where those are the people we serve. Or I don't have to deal with the bullshit from whoever your little local yokel PD is. Did you have a lot of content freedom when you were hosting uh, ESPN Radio? Uh, I would say yes and no. Um, like, the freedom is bound by common sense. Like, the content is to serve the audience. The content is not to serve my whims. Like, it was never a time that I was ever doing anything that I didn't think to myself the audience would find interesting or I did not think was in line with what was necessary to serve um, the audience. But I never had a single time ever that somebody told me, don't do that or you yep. can't do that. that. That never, ever came up. Uh, what about game theory? I, I imagine you have um, a cast of writers with that show. Yeah. Do you have a lot of content freedom with HBO? Yeah, I'm in charge. Yeah. Like how is How is it? work at because like going from um having your podcast where where it's it's all kind of you and and then radio is all kind of you and then having a, a team of of support how, how do you like that adjustment well the difficulty of that is the writers are in a bit of a unfair situation in that this isn't writing for most people that you write for in Hollywood, where basically you get to assign a point of view to them. Like you just write something that you think is good and something that you think fits their voice. And then you give it to them and then we work it out. People know my bars. They don't heard me rap. They know what it sounds like if it's somebody else doing it and not me. And so the writers who are always trying to write to the voice of the talent now have to do it in a different way than they had before. Um, and, What's tricky about that, particularly as like specifically being me, a particular sort of black person doing this is if you sending this stuff off to white people very often and be like, cool, go sound like the black guy. No pressure. Right. <laughs> you know, that's hard as hell. <laughs> There's a lot that comes with that. And so like working with people and watching the, like basically feeding the algorithm, teaching the algorithm, watching them learn how to get to the places that I wanted to be so that I strapped for time did not have to basically rewrite what it was that they were giving me that was that's a managerial process more than anything else because creatively ultimately in the end whatever they put forth i got the right to change it all the way up to the end you know and what about high noon how was how was that in terms of content freedom 
Oh, I mean, there's always content freedom on that. Um, I would make the argument we may have had a little too much content freedom. But I've I've never been in a place where I felt restricted yeah. on freedom of content outside of like notions of decency. That's it. Why why do you think that uh, High Noon didn't generate an, enough ratings to be long lasting? What was it not given enough time? Was there some sort of disconnect with the audience? Is it even something that you can pinpoint? Well, I mean, I think there's a couple of things. One, the ratings on High Noon weren't bad. Like they weren't great, but they weren't bad. However, if you look at the timeline of how it went, um, the contract for me and Pablo to do High Noon started, I want to call it March of 2017. The show didn't get onto the air until June of 2018. So that then means by March of 2019, we're in the one-year window of people figuring out what to do with contracts and everything else. Now, you also keep in mind that when I signed the contract to do High Noon, I had a pretty robust level of interest outside of this company. So I had as much financial leverage as I'd ever had. So what you then wind up with is at least one host, because I can talk about me. I ain't going to talk about nobody else's money in that way. You got at least one host that's making a lot of money, or at least in their eyes, making a lot of money doing a show that hasn't really developed a foothold yet um, and you've got a conversation to be had about renewing the contracts. The president of the company, when these contracts were signed, is no longer the president of the company. And then throw on the next part, and this is what's most important to me, to, I think, to discuss. Rather than people looking at it in the context of ratings, I look at it in the context of, well, how good was the show? And the answer was, yeah, not bad. And no one has to keep a show that's eh, not bad, you know? So you put all of those things together, and yeah, it makes sense that they could look up and say to themselves, eh, nah, I think that we could move on in another direction, um, in a cheaper direction. Because when you remember, when they moved us out, the show that they put in that time slot was Jalen and Jacoby, which yeah. is to say a show that they were already producing, a show that was already being made. Nobody had to come up with anything new. Nobody had to spend any more money in order to throw it in there. It's just, boom, there's Jalen and Jacoby. And something I don't know personally, but for you know the people who have questions about the ratings on High Noon, does anybody know what the ratings of Jalen and Jacoby were after, after they got in there? Like, does anybody know what the ratings of Sports Nation were before we got there? No, because that's not really, like, but so much what this is about. Is there is there an aspect of having to, like, swallow your pride after a show gets canceled and you're still working for the company um like did, did you ever feel inclined to almost leave espn out of spite after losing high noon no no because it wasn't personal it so wasn't no, like yeah it was there's, a, there's it, not a no it, just, was a it was a reasonable decision yeah like like i can look at it and see what they did and see why they did it and also just as an observer of media and watch the show yeah, no, no, there was not for me. Well, also, the other part, and this is important, this all happened in March of 2020. Yeah. Wasn't no time to be worried about swallowing no pride. It was about getting some checks. And so I remember, I forget what I'd heard being announced. It was when everything was getting shut down. I think it may have been the day the Google offices shut down because I had been talking to some other people trying to make some stuff happen. And I think it was the day the Google offices shut down. I called my agent and said, take the last offer. I don't care what it was. Just go back there and take it. It wasn't no time for like the, the oh man, I've got to go back to these places. Nah, that wasn't it. The only thing that bothered me, and this wasn't an ESPN thing. The thing that bothered me was Highly Questionable was still on. And my understanding is that they were trying to save it, right? Like the contract was coming up on it. They were trying to save the show. I had also had conversations with higher ups that had led me to believe that once I left High Noon, that I would go back to hosting Highly Questionable five days a week with Dan. And that did not happen. Um, and the explanation for why it did not happen was that there were a lot of people who wanted to do TV and they wanted to make sure that they had some place that they could go do TV, which is something I did not give a single solitary fuck about, nor do I think I should have, nor do I think they should have. That was the only thing that I found to be like 
maybe required a measure of swallowing pride is like highly questionable was never my show let's be clear um it was dan's show that ain't my city that ain't my daddy like all of those things that was dan's show i never had any measure of resentment for that but you can go back and look at the last episode that i did of highly questionable and you can talk to anybody who was involved in it and to a man they say me showing up on highly questionable saved that show from being canceled and it didn't just save it from being canceled it went from being a show that was on espn2 to the first of the shows that migrated from espn2 over to espn and the ratings that it ultimately got while dan poppy and i did it got to levels that nobody ever thought that though that they would get to and then i come back and you throw me into a rotation and Nah, that bothered me. That's that's the one that I mean, I did it, but that's the one that bothers me and honestly probably affected some relationships that came up subsequent because I just thought that that was a ridiculous decision and I just didn't I did are, not. Are you surprised that Dan didn't have enough pull to to say, no, I, I want Bomani to be on there? No, no, it's not about Dan have enough pull. The thing about the situation at that time was Dan, given how Dan operates. Dan was a person who always wanted to make sure that all these people got taken care of because who knows what he had in his mind about what his future plans were and everything else. So Dan was trying to be the nice guy and, you know, get get all his friends on in these various capacities. My problem was I felt like there were people higher up than him who were supposed to say, yeah, so what? Right. So Dan wants to do this this one way. I understand it. That's his call. That's his decision. I never had any problems with him about that. I had problems with the people who I thought were in a capacity where they should have told him, oh, well, we're trying to save this TV show. Like, if you're trying to save it, save it. If you're not, look out for your people. Do you feel underutilized by ESPN on TV? No. Well, I mean, let's be honest here. I'm not utilized at all by ESPN on TV yeah. at this point. Um, but I don't have a problem with that. I don't. I mean, look at the network. Look at what they air. Look at the types of programs that they're doing. Where is where is there for somebody who does what I do? Right? Like the kind of general opinion person that they used to have all over the place and that the shows used to cater to across the board. Where is there? Like on Get Up, if I'm not coming in to fill in as host, what is what is there for me to do? Go look at who the people are that they typically have with Stephen A. Smith. They're former athletes, insiders, that range of people. That's not what I do. So I don't think but of you, them. You do. I mean, Levitard has touted your ability to, de to debate. I'm sure you think of yourself as, as one of the best people at debating at ESPN. First Take is a debate show. Why aren't you on First Take more? Well, I would make, there's a couple arguments I think that you can make. One, that there's a measure of kind of like skill overlap with me and Stephen A in that sense, right? Like we are, we we fill similar roles, I would say. So I don't know if you get the like. I mean, I went up there to talk to him about Deion Sanders or whatever it is, you know, when when that stuff was going on. So yeah, I could be on first take. I good at debate is an amorphous, tricky term. Like Stephen A's better at doing that on television than anybody else. If you want to take this to the cards, right, and have the judges evaluate who's won this thing, then yeah, I probably like I probably can win out on that. But I also don't necessarily enjoy that. Yeah, like that's not quite what I feel like I want to do at this point in my career. So yeah. Could they use me more on television? Yeah, maybe, but not enough. I don't, I don't think it is at all personal that I'm not there as much as there was a role for somebody like me at that company years ago in a way that it just doesn't exist anymore. They do something different now. Uh, Chris Russo is not a former athlete, but he gets a lot of run on first take. Yeah. He's Chris Russo, <laughs> you know, like that's as a, he's, He's serving a much different purpose than I am. And he is kind of established, long established in this game and with a relationship with Steven that I don't have. So, yeah, no, that's correct. Like, you know, they have a place for Chris Russo, but that's the one guy we're talking about, really. They have a place for him on there. Would I want to just go do first take one day a week? Probably not. Yeah. Do you think people at ESPN are getting used to Chris Russo's shtick? Because last year it seemed like like JJ Reddick, Ryan Clark, Dominic Foxworth, like they, they didn't, didn't want to deal with him. And I grew up listening to WFAN. So like I, I have a, I love Chris Russo, but I can understand former athletes getting tired of him trying to boil every single debate down to how somebody played in their last playoff game or to what happened in the seventies the or eighties. Yeah. I, I do think that 
there is a measure of get accustomed to it yeah. um, that had to take place. I also think that a lot of the athletes looked up and realized that I'm going to come take down Chris Russo isn't nearly as compelling the second or third time yeah. as you may have thought um, that it was the first time. And the other part, and I think that this one is important, people like him, like personally. Like I've only met him one time, so I'm not the best person. My buddy Nick Wright knows him well because he you know, was on the radio station on, on Sirius with him. He's a good dude that people like, like he's just really, really loud. And you kind of got to get used to the voice and all of that stuff. But it helps that people like him personally. And they realize that whatever he's doing is his thing. But it's not it's not nearly as confrontational as I think that a lot of them would otherwise believe. How was debating against Skip Bayless? Well, what was interesting about it for me, and I haven't done it now in like 13 years, was I misunderstood who I was dealing with. And so I thought that he would find it refreshing that he had a real challenge in front of him. Now, no, 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 no. That's not that's 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 not it. That's not it. That's a man that thinks he's won every debate he's ever been in. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and so the first couple of times I did the show, I was doing it wrong because I'm not particularly confrontational. It's just not like in terms of how I, you know, the back and forth and stuff like that. That's not really how I do. And so they want confrontation. They want that collision. And uh we had one day i was there i tell the story not too often but i was there and somebody sent a text i think it was Derek brooks that sent a tweet in and asked skip bayless who was tough as opponent to debate was he was like oh easy greg anthony and i was kind of joking i'm like you know skip i'm right here baby he was like greg anthony and i was like okay you know, and I'm like, look, I'm not trying to come in this man's TV show, turn it over tables, like fighting him. Like, that was my thought the whole way. Like, I ain't trying to do all that. But that day I decided to. And I wore his ass out, just top to bottom. Like, there was just kind of, like, I was wearing his ass out on hood shit. Like, I was wearing his out on, like, high-minded stuff. I was wearing him out on sports stuff. Like, I just came in there dropping blows. That man ain't say a word to me, and they didn't call me again to come debate with Skip Bayless. <laughs> Um, and so the tricky thing about doing that with Skip is if you're not somebody that knows him very well, he's not really talking with you. He's so locked in personally. Like, this means something different to him than it means to other people. Yeah. And he's so locked <clears throat> into whatever it is that he's doing that you're not going to get a lot of interaction. And then if what you say to him is not something he expected or he can rock with, this whole thing is just going to shut down. You were you were very complimentary to Skip earlier this year when um, you were with on uh, House of Strauss. And at the time, not many people were complimentary of Skip because it was shortly after the DeMar Hamlin tweet and, and some of his blow ups with with Shannon Sharp. Um, did you and I'm, I'm also kind of surprised that after after knowing that Skip stopped calling you back to first take, that you're still complimentary of his ability to to be on TV and, and host a debate show, even though it's like he he says he he wins every, every debate, but. He doesn't necessarily want somebody that he can't that he he can't beat in a debate yeah. on, on with him like that. That seems kind of um, I, I would I would think that you'd be a little bit more critical of him basically after that. Yeah, but I mean, that does not change how good he is at doing a television show in that format. So like one, the DeMar Hamlin tweet. Everybody else was wrong. Skip was not. Every single person that came and brought that hammer down on Skip was wrong. That was the ridiculous outrage machine of social media looking for somebody to gang up on, and they found the guy to gang up on, and it was Skip Bayless. Now, the, the argument against Skip in that case is that he is a professional communicator, and he did not communicate in a way that was very clear to everybody. And maybe you could say that that was his fault. But all he was saying was the same thing. I could have said the same exact thing Skip said, and people wouldn't have brought it to me because people don't feel the way about me that they feel about Skip, which is very simply, they can't keep playing this game. However, they can't stop this game. What in the world are they to do? What's this, you know, what's this going to be? And I think that people assume that just because Skip can be a bit of a jerk that he's like some kind of callous bad dude which is absolutely 100% not the case about him for my experience with him. Before I did first take with him, and when we both worked at Page 2, we would, he would email. He was always very, very nice to me and all of those things. But no matter how it is that I feel about him personally, that does not change the fact that you ain't never seen that man stutter on television not once. Like, say what you want about Skip, but if you're going to do the kind of television that he does, 
What makes him so good is that he takes a very strong and clear position every time, and you know exactly where it is that he's coming from. You may not agree with what he says, but there is no confusion or mystery about what he was talking about. I'll give you another example of somebody very, very good on television that people think that just because they don't like him that they're not good at television. Jay Mariotti on Around the Horn. You go back and watch those clips of Mariotti. There's a reason they were putting him on television every day. The man spoke clearly. The man never stammered. And you knew exactly where he was coming from, no matter what the topic was. And that's how I feel about Skip. And so for me, no, I will never have a problem saying what's true about somebody. And, you know, that's what it is with him. There are all kinds of negative things. If you want to say them about Skip, you can. But ain't nobody putting him on television as a favor. He is a legitimate pioneer for the journalist trying to figure out how to turn himself into somebody bigger than their newspaper, bigger than their publication, and then make the transition into doing his television stuff. Skip is one of the rare people who ever truly mattered at ESPN. And what I mean by mattered is Jamie Horowitz comes in, looks at the ratings of cold pizza at the time, or first take at the time, and it's like, yo, the ratings spike when Skip's on. The whole show should be Skip. This network doesn't do that for people very often, right? They're not telling anybody that you're the star. But there was no other option with him because it was so clear because he really is that good at this. So why do you think people are always so quick to to try to pile on? Is it because he he says that he never loses a debate? Nah, is it, a- is it because some of the the brash comments that he's yeah. made over the years? Oh yeah, yeah, he's a bit insufferable. <laughs> like, like, I mean, I'm not going to pretend as though insufferability is not part of it. But and he's an easy target, and he takes it. You know, like he'll come on. Like one thing about it. You don't hear Skip complain that much about the way people are mean to him. Yeah. You know, he's my from my experience with him and from talking to other people, he does find it a bit confusing that he's the one guy that everybody comes down on um, in that way. But, no, he is an incredibly, incredibly easy target. And it's like the thing that everybody can get, you know, can get together on is how much they don't like Skip. I'm just not one of those people. Yeah. Yeah. Um... This is a, is a big hypothetical, but say Skip and Shannon did end up divorcing earlier this year after, after some of their on-air blow-ups. Would you have been interested in, in teaming up with Skip Bayless for a debate show? No. Is that because of Skip, or is that just that that format just is not something that uh, appeals yeah, I to don't, you? I don't really want to do that. I, I am not particularly interested at this point, and maybe <clears> something <throat> will change, but the idea of, hey, we're going to put you with a co-host, I don't think I want to do that again. What do you think about Stephen A. Smith starting to pivot a little bit in, into politics and the new podcast that he has? Um, I mean, if that's what he wants to do, I haven't really listened to the podcast. I've heard, you know, some of the snippets um, that they put online, but I don't see any reason for him not to do that. And I think, I mean, we've known this for a long time about Stephen A. His ambitions have always been bigger and grander yeah. than sports. And, you know, it's a kind of a new world order um, at the company with them allowing people to do things that are outside of the company or allowing him to do a podcast like that. Um, And so I wish him the best on it. I'm interested. I mean, he has talked about having, you know, people approaching him about going into politics. I would not be surprised at all to see him actually do it like like that. In fact, I may be more surprised, I mean, more surprised than not. If he were to not go into politics, really, at this point, look, man, he's really, really, really famous. Like, I, I don't think that's something that can really easily be explained to people. It's just what the magnitude of Stephen A. Smith is at this point in time. And if he decided to run, I would not be terribly surprised. I don't have any idea whether or not he could win. I don't know where he would run. I don't know any of those things. But it wouldn't shock me at all if he decided he wanted to run for office. Is that something though that do you think he would have to start at like a local level in running for office or or right, uh, how local are you talking? Uh, I don't, I mean like could you see him running for running for governor? Like I I don't I don't know that. I could. Uh, oh really? I could see him doing that. I don't know if that would be the wisest idea necessarily. Right right, right. yeah. But sure. I could see him doing that. I could see him running or jumping for the house. right into something like that. Yeah, like I could see him running for the house. Like, but he moves like a politician and i don't mean that in a bad way but he moves like a man that knows that everybody's looking at him and that when he talks everybody sits up and listen did you have any issue with Stephen a interviewing clay travis like does that does that bother you being that you guys are espn colleagues did it did that bother you at all no i mean if look if i were going to have a problem with that it would Stephen a and i are friendly we are not friends yeah you know like that's not my homeboy i'm not gonna call him up 
and chat about the game. Um, if we were, maybe I would view that somewhat differently. But I understand that Stephen A. views himself as a centrist. Like he says this kind of out loud is that he yep. sees himself as a, as a centrist. And to be a centrist, you kind of have to go in both directions on that. And thereby you wind up talking to Clay Travis. Uh, were you more surprised that Don Lemon was let go by CNN or Tucker was let go by Fox News this week? Or on the Well, you know, way? I do a decent bit of work there with the yeah. CNN people. Um, I am not surprised by either, but for very um, different reasons. I think with Don, it just became a question you ask yourself about fit right fit in what he's doing fit in where they, the network is everything else like, i want to be very careful because i don't know too much about the inner workings but i think that we had read enough things in the trades and seen enough things to not be surprised that somebody would make a decision to move on from him like this is the game people get let go of you know just get let go all the time with carlson again everything else that swirled it wasn't terribly surprising the part with carlson that i think that gets lost is that for all those ratings, his presence had been so toxic for so long to blue chip advertisers that they wasn't really getting the money out of it that one would think that they should get from such a time slot. Um, and for Fox, it was funny. I had lunch with somebody the day that happened. And I looked at him and I said, well, do you remember who Tucker Carlson replaced? And he was just like, oh, wow, I don't know. And I was like, it was Bill O'Reilly. Bill O'Reilly, yeah. Like, Bill O'Reilly's not a small person, but it, that easily you could forget. They're going to put somebody else in there and they can build it back up if they want to, right? So I was actually surprised given all of what would happen, all the things that had happened with Carlson over the years. I think it's as much a surprise as anything else that this didn't happen sooner. But I think it just, with all the stuff with the lawsuits and everything else, he just became more trouble than he was worth. Do you have an interest in a, a bigger role on cable news or are the occasional cnn hits enough it depends like i don't have a answer necessarily on what like what like i mean i'm a part-time employee at espn right now right like when game theory is in season i do game theory so if somebody comes up to me and they've got something interesting to propose then yeah we could talk about it and see what it is but what i do know at this point in my career having done game theory things that are creative things that allow me to build that, that allow me to conceive of things those are the things that I kind of want to get into um, at this point. So that's why I was like, you know, when you asked the question about being used more at ESPN, I just don't know if that kind of television is what I want to do right now. Yeah. Um, last thing, how much do you love and appreciate the aggregate media? <laughs> I mean, they make my life a lot easier in the sense that I can like mess around and find out something that's going on right quick. Um, do you like the headlines that we write about you? <clears throat> I generally, it's not that often that yeah. I find a headline about me that I find that problematic, right? What I'm always surprised by is that anybody wants to read about me. <laughs> like that's that that's the strangest thing but in the world. I think to me. I think they want to read about your opinions. Yeah, but I, there's also but there's a cottage industry of just like the coverage of sports media, like even like the entirety of the site that you work for. Yeah, it blows my mind that this site can exist and be yeah. profitable. <laughs> Like, clearly it can, and clearly you guys get it, but people yeah. care about the people in our industry in a way that they don't <laughs> elsewhere. I think that it's a function of the fact that we talk about sports and transactions all the time. Like, the people who cover the music industry aren't sitting around like, yo, somebody got dropped from their contract this week. Like, it doesn't work that way. Like, you don't have wires that, you know, that move like this does. So, as a result, people talk about us um, the same way. And so, I don't necessarily mind the headlines I I just always worry whether or not the person who is doing the aggregating actually gets my point and if they are providing adequate context to what it is that I've said. I have less problem with the aggregating media than I have with people who work in social media at these sites or at these shows or whatever that then decide that they want to push the content. They're the ones that I have a problem with because they're the sociopaths looking for hits and, and the indifference very often of whoever it is that is a guest on their show. Like, I'll give an example. I did something once with Dan, and I forget what we were talking about, something, it was the Brian Flores thing or whatever it was, and it was a classic interview with a white person, and they're like, well what, get, well, what has to change to fix the problems of the league? And I was like, yeah, white people are what's got to change. And my fundamental point was and remains. Racism is a white people problem. 
like there's nothing like they always ask a black person what can we do to fix this as if if we didn't have the magic solution we wouldn't have been been done that right like we have the greatest incentive to figure it out no it's white people was i saying that white people are the only problem in the world no it wasn't any of those things but the levitar people just thought the clip was funny and so they're just like first of all again leaning on it for the idea that it's funny not the fundamental point yeah and so they put this clip out that's just what's the problem white people so you know who gets a hold of that right and so now i got people calling my bosses and everything else and making this a thing and then i go do cnn that night and they're like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, we, you know, as a people doing, saying da da da. And I'm like, we ain't got to talk about these people, right? We don't have to take them seriously. But I have greater problems when people who run something or run some outlet that you have given your time to for free to do, you know, to do something with them, and they don't look out for you yeah. in terms of how they present the content after the fact. Had another one where I had to fix this because, uh. I had this happen when I went on CNN and I started talking about Deion Sanders and they put the clip out and the cry on was their initial question that I dismissed myself, which was, is Deion Sanders a sellout? Like that's what's reading under the screen. Nothing I say in that viral clip really gets heard because all they see underneath is, is Deion Sanders a sellout? Right. And so now I got friends calling me like, Hey, Dion's son called me and wanted to know if it was okay that you called his dad a sellout. And I'm like, go listen to it. I didn't call his dad a sellout, right? So where it got weird for me after that is then Dan Patrick show, which I've been on a few times, they put out a clip where Dan had misunderstood because of the cryon thing, I mean, the Chiron thing, right? And he asked Marcellus Wiley, well, Bomani Jones says Deion Sanders is a sellout. And then Marcellus is talking about me being a sellout, me saying Dion's a sellout. And then he's talking about me saying that Dion's a sellout. And I never said that thing, you know? So I called Dan's people and I was just like, hey, man, um, you know, you know, all, all the stuff I just said right there. And they're like, yeah, we corrected Dan. I'm like, yeah, but then it went out on social. And they're like, oh, didn't realize that happened. We'll take it down. You see what I mean? But so it winds up, I have more problems with the outlets that someone like me can appear on not being protective of no, enough of their guests when they then like when it happened with Levitard, I called a social guy and I was just like, Hey man, you know, look, I know you didn't mean nothing by it. You know, like I know you weren't thinking of it that way, but you just got to keep in mind that I need y'all to look out for me when it comes to this, because you guys have the control and that, that is more of a concern to me than the aggregators. All right. Noted. So we'll, uh, we'll try to take extra caution with the clips that we put out <laughs> from this podcast. I'd appreciate that. <laughs> All right, Bomani, thanks a lot. I've kept you long enough, but you've uh, you've been awesome. No, nah, man, I appreciate it. I'm going to just throw a little plug myself. Uh, check yeah. out The Right Time with Bomani Jones Podcast. We got nominated uh, for a Webby. We'll find out in May whether or not we win said Webby. I think Draymond probably beat us out for the people's choice uh, element of that. But no, that's been – if there's been a joy of this pandemic, it has been watching that podcast kind of do rocket ship things. Good stuff. All right, and this is the Awful Announcing Podcast. I'm Brandon Contis. Thanks for listening. Be good. Thanks for listening to the Awful Announcing Podcast. For the latest news spanning the sports media landscape and more, check out awfulannouncing.com and follow us at Awful Announcing.